Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Accelerate Portfolio Company Value Creation with Customer Insights. This webinar is presented to you in partnership with Strategex. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your GoToWebinar toolbar to ask questions. The questions will be monitored and the presenters will answer as many as possible at the end of today's presentation. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on ACG's website along with the slides from today's presentation. Thank you all again for joining us. Now I'm going to turn it over to Anthony Barr and Kay Cruz, Vice President at Strategex. Thanks, Cassie, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, just by way of quick introduction, uh, Strategex is a research and consulting firm based in Chicago. And we really specialize in, specialize in using customer insights to help our clients accelerate and sustain their growth. Um, today, we're working with about 50 private equity firms and therefore a couple hundred of their portfolio companies to do just that. Today, what we want to talk about are tool, two of those customer insight tools that we use quite often to help portfolio companies accelerate growth and prepare for sale. Those two tools being 80-20 segmentation and voice of the customer. So today we're gonna to just give some best practices on how to think about these two tools. And Kay's also gonna take us through a case study where we actually use these two in tandem to really realize rapid financial improvement. And of course, we'll have some time at the end for, for questions as well. So to, to start out, just a, a little anecdote. There's a, what you see here is the Museum of Science and Industry here in Chicago. And right now, I think it's still going on, they, they have an exhibit that is called Patterns in Nature. And it's this really interactive exhibit where they demonstrate how nature influences both ancient and modern architecture. And they go through over 200 examples of this. So just really quickly, they show how a, a shell was used by David Burnham as inspiration for a spiral staircase that he develops. And they show fractal branching, right? This idea that um, every branch is half the width of the previous branch and how that's used in this example. And also more abstract examples, Borono patterns, seemingly random patterns, and how they can be applied in more modern examples. I, I, I thought it was an interesting uh, reminder that there's patterns everywhere, right? We just have to look hard enough to realize them. And there's patterns in our own businesses. In B2B, we know one pattern we see time and time again is the 80-20 rule, right? This notion that 80% of the results come from 20% of the effort, right? We see it when it comes to customers, we see it when it comes to products, we see it when it comes to revenue, we see it when it comes to people. Time and time again, this 80-20 you know, axiom just, just always holds true. Just a little bit of trivia, 80-20 rule, also known as the Pareto principle, discovered by this guy, uh, Vilfredo Pareto, an um, Italian economist, who was tasked with conducting a census of the Italian goat population, of all things. Uh, the, the Italian government sent him out and said, hey, we want to count all the goats in the country. It was his first task. Uh, he went village to village, and he tallied all the sheep. And what he found after about three years of doing this um, is that consistently 80% uh, of the goats were owned by 20% of the people. And he was just shocked by how consistent this was true. So he said, wow, this is interesting. Why don't I go look at land ownership? He found that 80% of the land was owned by 20% of the people. He looked at income and 80-20 held true. So he's like, wow, I'm really onto something. And, and, and as a good researcher, he wanted to validate his hypothesis. So he went to France and he did the same thing there. And he found 80-20, 80-20, 80-20. So just a little interesting story and the origins of how this rule came about. We see it today in much more contemporary examples. Kay's gonna take us through a few of these. So for instance, uh, one of the hottest topics, reviewing, 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 20% of the members of Yelp actually submit 80% of the reviews. So there's a pattern that's consistent again. We also know that 80% of the issues that are at work in the workplace, according to the Res Human Resource Management uh, Society, is caused by 20% of the employees. So those problem children are causing 80% of the issues. So certainly looking at it from that standpoint. Um, something we all do. From that standpoint, go into your closet, 
Whirlpool tells us that you're wearing 20% of your clothes 80% of the time. So I challenge you when you get home this after this evening to go into your closet and do a simple count. And invariably you will find that you're probably wearing 20% of your clothes as your favorites 80% of the time. So time and time again, we see this pattern um, in our personal lives and certainly in our business life, as, as Anthony mentioned. So everyone normally says, yeah, I think, you know, 80% of my revenue is coming from about 20% of my customers. And everybody uses this kind of a rule of thumb, certainly from that standpoint. Um, but as you think about your business, nine chances out of 10, 80% of your revenue is coming from 20% of your products as well. So the real challenge as we look at business and as we look at trying to improve the profitability and accelerate the growth of a business is where are you spending all this extra effort? Are you spending it on the 20% of your products and customers that matter the most? Or are you spending it everywhere? Because most of us tend to focus on everything because everything's important. And one of the things that we use as an 80-20 kind of best practice is not everything is always the most important thing. You have to provide focus. You have to look at your business differently. And you have to try to simplify your business so you can find the right resources in the right time. So here's an example, real world example for all the basically hundreds of, of different businesses that we look at year over year engagement after engagement, we try to use what we call, let's divide up, in this case, we've got an example of 200 customers. Let's break them into quartiles or quarters, so one through 50, 51 through 100, 101 through 150, and 151 through 20, 200. So we're gonna say, what percent of revenue is coming out of these customers? And time and time again, we see that it's not necessarily 80%, it actually is the top 25% of creating 89% of your revenue, followed by 7%, 3%, and 1%. So here we have, again, looking at this as, a, as an example, time and time again, we see this to be pretty much always the point. We may see that first 25% of customers creating actually maybe as much as 93 or 94% of revenue. We often will see that maybe it's down a little bit, could be 84, 85%, but it still is a predominant uh, percent of revenue that is driven by the top, we call them the quartile or the top 25% of the customers. So what we wanna pay attention to is looking at the fact that in essence, we have 96% of the business driven by, in this case, half of the customers. The other half of the customers which you pay attention to because they call, they wanna know what's going on, they're the 20% that are causing the issues, they are actually only contributing 4% to your revenue. So clearly, we've got a lot of distracted businesses, a lot of distracted business owners, business managers, portfolio managers, saying how come we can't get as much done as we should be getting done? Well, if you're focusing on all the customers equally at the same time, you're focusing on 4% who don't really matter a bit. So when we look at the percent of costs, accounting principles say, hey, we use 25, 25, 25, 25. We apply all of the, all of the resources, all the overhead costs get applied consistently and importantly across all customer segments equally because that's the way we do it. Accounting says, make everything equal. Put your overhead against all your customers. True. All right, but now what? From the standpoint of looking at the profitability, let me ask a question. What do you think is the percent of profit that each one of these um, particular quartiles or quarters, 25% of each, what percent of operating profit comes from that top 25% of customers? So we're gonna open up a poll and let you, basically let's do our old guesstimate. What do you think it is? Is it 80%, 85%, 90%, or 
or greater than 95%. So we've got some poll numbers coming in. People are voting. Thanks for voting. This is great. We're going to keep it running for just a little bit. And looking at some math majors in attendance here. I think you're right. <laughs> we got some very good guesstimating going on. All right, let's go ahead and close it off, and I'll tell you where you guys voted. You actually voted, um, to Anthony's point, math majors among us. 21% of you said it was an 80% operating profit. 15% said it was an 85% operating profit. 26% said it was a 90% operating profit. And the winner, you're darn right, 38% say it's 95% or more. So as we look at the actual numbers, we get back to it. Here's what we see, again, in our real world 80-20 examples. We see 150% of the profit is coming out of your first 25% of your customers. So let's imagine if you had 1,000 customers and you divided it by that by quartiles. You're still going to see the same number. 150% is coming out of that first 25% of your customers. You're breaking even, give or take, with that second range of customers that are contributing 7% of the revenue. Where What's going on here, as you look at the bottom two, is you're losing money, and you're losing lots of money in the last one. So one of the things that we try to do is say, let's try to figure out how we can concentrate on our top two tiers of customers, figure out how to leave behind some of the other customers that are in these bottom two tiers, so that you're not only losing lots of money, you're losing less money, and importantly, you're focusing your resources where you're going to drive the most amount of profit to your bottom line for your company. And I'll give it back to Anthony. And what we find is that the same holds true when we conduct this analysis on products, right? 89.731, consistent allocation of revenue across the four quartiles of products. You know, I mean, when, you know, we do this probably over a hundred times a year. Um, I don't think we've seen these numbers exceed this range, you know, plus or minus five points. It's just amazing how consistent this is in B2B examples. Uh, don't believe us? Try it out yourself. It's pretty easy to, to calculate share of revenue by quartile. You might be surprised how, how true this holds. And, you know, when Kay and I were putting these slides together, you know, we, we both come out of sort of the marketing strategy world, and we were just kind of joking about how over-engineered customer segmentation sometimes becomes. You know, we look at behaviors, we look at demographics, we look at firmographics, we look at attitudes, and we come up with these really complex segmentation schemes, right? 10, 12, 20 different customer segments. And it's no surprise to us that in our, our past lives doing this work, how disappointed customer, our clients often were because they just couldn't action against it. And what's nice about this approach is just how elegant it is in its simplicity. Because if you take your customers and you cross it by your products, you end up discovering that there's only really four segments that matter in any given business. Right? We've got our critical few customers buying our insignificant many products. And we call this the necessary evil. What do we mean by this? We mean these are our top customers buying our lower products. In other words, the 20% of customers that really matter, buying the 80% of products that don't necessarily matter. 80% times 20, 80% times 20%, 16% of the business. We call this the necessary evil because we have to retain this aspect of the business. Because remember, these are our top customers. We don't want them having to go somewhere else to get something that we don't offer. We don't want them experimenting with other suppliers. We don't want them competitively bidding. We want to do whatever we can to retain them. We also have what we call the over-service. And these are the insignificant many customers, right? our, our 80% that are only generating 20% of our revenue, that are buying our, our top products. right? So there's still some value here. The key is understanding how do we get those critical few products 
in the hands of the insignificant many customers without as much cost. So common strategies we help implement here are things like e-commerce, going through distribution. How can we lower the overhead to service these customers? Because again, it, it, it's not nothing. It's 16% of the business. We just have to find ways to squeeze costs out of there. And then we've got the baggage. And baggage both financially, but also baggage emotionally. Uh, because these are the customers that don't really matter that are buying the products that don't really matter. It's 4% of the business, but it's likely 25% of the cost. It's just a loss center, right? But these are still people, right? It's still an emotional aspect here. We can't just say, buy customers, we don't wanna work with you anymore. But what we can do is treat them differently, right? Not treat them poorly, but treat them differently. You know, we can say things like, no, I won't overnight that for free, but I could expedite some other aspect. No, I won't give you this discount, but if you, commit to higher volume, I can maybe help you out there. So it's, it's finding a ways, so still making sure we're getting the value out of these customers um, without losing too much out of them. The one that we really want to focus on today is the one that matters. And this is what we call the ports, right? These are the, the top customers buying our top products, 80% of our revenue from a customer and product perspective, 64% of a typical business. Absolutely critical to retain. This is what drives the business forward. And you need to secure it. You have to make sure those customers are as loyal and stable as they possibly can be. So how do you do that? First, you have to establish a strong relationship. You have to meet customer expectations. From there, you ladder up and you start building loyalty. Delighting the customer, surprising the customer at every touch point, starting to not just meet their expectations, but really exceed them. And then this evolution, right? How do we get our customers to stop thinking of us as just a vendor just a supplier, but really a strategic partner, someone that can help us win and grow, ultimately creating what we call a raving fan. So this is the loyalty ladder, if you will. We want to get as many raving fans in the port as possible, because again, they're absolutely critical to retain. And there's a whole lot of benefits of doing this, both tangible and intangible. First, obviously, you retain that business, but along the way, we're also increasing wallet share, we're able to sustain premium prices, high value customers, no high value prospects, and they're more likely to refer us. All of this culminates in a situation where we are very well positioned to exceed industry growth rates. So the real question is that we should raise with everybody that is listening in is how secure is your port as you look at it? Um, Anthony's described clearly four quadrants and the one that matters the most to us is that very top customer buying your very top products. So there are lots of ways to secure the fort. There are many, just as there are many ways to try to define what's going on with customers. These are a variety of tools that we would use in order to make sure the fort is secure. So in many cases, we have to simplify the business so that we have time to exercise and focus on those top customers. So we can do that through a lot of different approaches here. Um, that you see, for instance, the quadrants that are called out, the core trials are called out. Uh, Magnificent Seven is, is a, again, a seven different principles that we use. You'll notice there's a voice of the customer at the bottom of this as well. Voice of the customer is extremely valuable because that's a way of assessing, is this really working? And of course, for voice of the customer, one of the things that we all use, just as we intuitively have the 80-20 principle in our lives, wearing 20% of our clothing 80% of the time. We've all experienced a net promoter score on a scale of zero to 10, how likely will you be to recommend company X, Y, or Z to a colleague? In the business to business world, it still is working quite well. In the consumer world, it's starting to fall on deaf ears. We are surveyed to death. There is a lot of survey fatigue going on in our world today. Many of you I'm sure have have hung up on Sprint calling you to find out how you did, or you hung up on United Airlines when they asked you yet one more time to do a web survey to tell you how well they did. And of course, we've all experienced the net promoter score basically takes the percent of people who are giving you uh, six, seven and below and subtracting that, those people from the people who are giving you the nines and tens, those that we call the raving fans or the promoters. In this case, you can see this particular group is 75% is, are 
our promoters, we subtract the detractors, and that gives us a 65 net promoter score. Oftentimes we're asked, well, wait a minute, you know, seven and eight is clearly a pretty good score as well, so what's going on here? Um, what's going on is that, yeah, they're loyal, but they tend to want to be more or less likely in that second area. Yes, they're buying some of your products, but if they've got another new product coming up for bid, they're going to look at you and they're going to look at somebody else. You have not pushed them over the edge of becoming a raving fan. They are not, they are not thinking about you exclusively as being the only, the only supplier that they want to work with. Net promoter score, it's a diagnosis. It's a, it's a line in the sand. It's a tool. It's not prescriptive. It doesn't tell you what's going on, what's driving that score. If it's a great score, you don't know what you're doing great. If it's a bad score, gee, why is it so, why is it so negative? Why is, scores can be anywhere from a minus 100 to a positive 100. So, and believe it or not, yes, we have seen top customers who are giving a minus, a minus score. Uh, we have some where we've done analysis and we see minus 40. That is a business that is performing very, very poorly. Its customers are extraordinarily unhappy. In many cases, they're working with you because there's not another alternative. And that's not a great place to be when you're in business trying to turn a profit and trying to grow. So again, net promoter score. In order to create raving fans, we have to look at things more broadly. We have to understand what's going on. Why do they love us? So we call it this a more holistic approach. We really want to have our customers help us look at the business from a 360 degree point of view. We want to know what we're doing well on. We want to know where we're going, where we where we are failing or where we are not necessarily going to, to the level that the customer wants us to go to. We want to understand how we work from a competitive standpoint. How, what do we do differently that competitors do? What do they love about some of the things that our competitors do that we should be thinking about doing ourselves? So looking at it from that standpoint, raving fans are that group of customers, those top customers that would never think about doing business with anyone other than you. And that's where we ultimately want to be. The voice of the customer, great tool to find out, one, what's going on, certainly from a competitive standpoint, a performance standpoint, but importantly, it becomes very prescriptive. It will let us know, yeah, the score is this, but these are all the reasons why the score is what it is. I mean, we've all experienced being raving fans or not raving fans. We've all experienced it as we get on an airline. Some people are get to board before anybody else. Those are called the global customers. They're spending a lot of money with people. Some people even get escorted to the plane and on the plane and in their first class seat. And that poor family that only travels once every two years with all five or six of their kids is going to be in the very, very, very back of what's now called the flying bus as opposed to the front of the airline. So we know how to deal with voice of the customer as a tool and how to separate customers out for what things will drive that loyalty and will drive that very, very important relationship. So best practice. One of the things that this has to do, certainly from a voice of the customer standpoint, as well as an 80-20 process, is it's a continuous improvement tool. This is not something that's done as a one and done. Okay, check the box, we did it. We did a voice of the customer, we're done. We did an 80-20, we're done. No, it's something that you continue to monitor and evolve as the business evolves. As you grow, as you look towards new product development, as you look towards new market segments, Certainly, each time we have to try to understand where are we going. As businesses look at one another, first thing that has to happen, just as Anthony was talking about that ladder all the way up to going from a, a, a vendor up to a preferred partner or a raving fan, one of the things that we find is absolutely necessary, certainly from a business standpoint, is businesses like to work with businesses that they trust, that they feel they have, has, have a great deal of integrity. Oftentimes, we'll see negative scores on an NPS, and the reason for it might be as we talk to them, well, you know, they signed a contract, they said they were going to honor the contract, and six months later, they, they tore the contract up, and I'm furious. Not a very happy camper. Obviously, you have to supply what's expected. You have to be able to, one, have good delivery, good quality product, have to have a competitive price, 
And that's not to say the cheapest price, because as Anthony said, companies with strong scores will often have a premium price because why? They're buying more from you than just a product. They're buying the service. They're buying a relationship. They're buying the fact that you make their life easy. And that's where we move to this next level, which is you're responsive, you're attentive, you're easy to work with, you resolve problems very quickly. Every business at some point in time is going to have a problem. The question is how do you resolve it? We have customers who will say to us, I will be a customer for life because of the way they handled that recall. They gave back every bit of money that I had spent in installing it. They got the product back to me. They reimbursed me for the fact that I had to reinstall it again. It was great. I'm a customer for life. That is exactly the kind of raving fan you want to have. And importantly, the most critical part of this continuous improvement is to be sure you're always helping your customer win. What are new innovations are on? What are they looking for? What do they want to see? Where are their unmet needs? We want to look at what speed to market they want to have. It used to be you could have it fast, it's cheap, or it's good. Now it has to be all three, and now in order to differentiate it, it has to be even better. So speed to market becomes very important. How you engage and how you collaborate becomes critical, again, as a part of this continuous improvement tool using the variety of tools that we put in our toolkit for 8020 and for voice of the customer. So to get the feedback from customers that we need to not only assess where in this pyramid we are today, but what we have to do to get better going forward, we need to collect data. And as Kay mentioned earlier, survey fatigue, it's a real thing. Uh, number two in terms of best practices is really ditching these online surveys. Not to not to geek out too much about the methodology behind this, but there's several types of biases we're worried about when we're conducting research. Two of those are self-selection bias. Um, we know, right, if 80-20 is a thing in our business in terms of customers and products, we know it's more like 99-1 when it comes to survey response rates. Very, very few people actually participate in these. So there's that, there's that response bias and there's also self-selection bias. The people who do participate tend to be the ones that love us or hate us. It's a very polarized set of feedback. We never really get a holistic, well-rounded understanding of where we stand with our top accounts when we go the web survey route. Other downfalls are you're just really limited with the number of questions you can ask. You know, I think if you if you go over five minutes on a web survey, you're going to have people start to exit. And also, it's, 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 a, it's an okay tool to giving quantitative feedback, but it's really awful at qualitative context. Yes, you can get things like net promoter score online, but what you're not going to get is that you know, more open-ended feedback on how you can actually make your score better. Online surveys are fast, they're cheap, you can probably DIY it, but in B2B, if you want to create raving fans, you're not going to get what you need by going through web surveys. What does work is number three, the utilization of phone interviews. With phone interviews, what we typically observe is a response rate between 70 and 80%. You can still get quantitative feedback. You can still get enough promoter score and satisfaction ratings but it's a very nice hybrid approach of quantitative and qualitative. So every time you ask something like, how loyal are you? You can immediately follow up and say, why? Tell me more. Tell me what we can do to get better. So it's a nice mix of both and it becomes very diagnostic, but also very prescriptive at the same time. And also it goes a long way in just helping engage with customers. Just by virtue of doing this over the phone shows customers you care. It gives them an opportunity to provide more in-depth feedback. And as we'll see later on, it also gives you an opportunity to follow up with them in a really effective manner to realize some, sh some short-term wins with these top accounts. Okay, so we're talking to top accounts. What do we wanna do? How do we wanna see them? One of the things we say is certainly look at a spectrum. To look at and talk to a variety of functions. Um, there are rarely any businesses where there is a one-on-one -on -one only relationship. Likely there is a one-on multiple. You'll have procurement people, you'll have engineering people, you'll have technical support people uh, that have to interface with your company. You'll have the key decision makers. 
Uh, you'll have all of the people that are responsible for helping their business grow. Talk to a variety of them. They're all going to think about your company a little bit differently. Um, certainly make sure that the interviews mirror the composition of your business. In, that, in other words, the, the interviews themselves have to be kind of a microcosm of your business model. And we want to make sure that you can be very, what we call, opportunistic. Yes, you're going to talk to those top accounts. You want to make sure they understand how, where, or where are they on the raving fan spectrum. But we also want to look at what we call the strategic accounts. Uh, those accounts that you think, man, there's just, I mean, this is a critical, this is a really important business within our industry, and we want to try to understand what we can do better for them. Um, how can we grow our business with them? What do we need to do? We want to look at some prospects, people who've had some exposure to you. And importantly, another one that's terrific is to talk to somebody that's left you. Why did you leave? What can we do to earn your business back again? Um, yes, it has to be a much, much shorter interview. But importantly, they can give you a lot of line of sight into what went wrong. And oftentimes, what went wrong is something that's very fixable. And so from that standpoint, it's a great it's a great tool. Importantly, one of the things we want to ask is make sure that you're tailoring the question for the person, the role of the person, as well as the function. So get feedback on your primary contact. Uh, this is an individual that has day-to-day -day contact with that particular business. When we are asking it as a third party, one of the things that we often find is we can we find out more things about what's going on than if the salesperson is actually asking that person themselves. Importantly, when we're doing something relative to looking at new product ideas or new ideas that are on the drawing board from R&D, uh, if you have a really solid relationship between that salesperson and the customer and the salesperson thinks that's the hokiest idea I've ever seen, why would we do that? If he or she presents that idea to a, to a customer, I can assure you they're probably going to put a bit of a slant of prejudice on, oh, no, customers, did, they didn't like it. Well, they probably didn't like it because he or she kind of wrinkled up their face saying, this is a silly idea. So, you know, complaint handling. How well do you engage with management? All of those questions become very important in a VOC, certainly to understand what's going on and what could be going on differently, better, uh, differently improved. Uh, it's just from the standpoint of where are the industry trends going and what do we need to be doing to help our customers stay ahead of those. So in the past two years, um, I've done two projects where the net promoter score for two different businesses were the exact same. They were both plus 22. One was an internet service provider. And when I was presenting the findings, I was really complimenting them on what a great score they had. To get a plus 22 in that category is almost unheard of. You know, it's, it's near monopolistic. Nobody really likes their ISP cable provider. To actually get a positive net promoter score is, is quite an accomplishment. The other company whose net promoter score was also plus 22 was a medical device manufacturer. And in that presentation, I was telling them how critical the situation really is because their net promoter score was only plus 22. And a lot of the reasons we heard were reliability and accuracy and things that really, I mean, no, no, all joking aside, was putting patient safety in, in jeopardy. And I think that just demonstrates why it's so important to always include some sort of benchmark exercising exercise when you're doing this. Because one number alone doesn't really tell us much unless it's put in context, right? Is a plus 22 good or bad? I can't tell you. What I can tell you is that a plus 22 is better than the competition because they're getting a zero. What I can tell you is a plus 22 is pretty bad because the competition is getting an 80. So having a point of comparison really helps us understand uh, and, and contextualize the feedback we're getting. So and, and along the way, it also uncovers some really valuable competitive insights. What other suppliers or customers are working with? What can we do to steal share from them? Have we lost any opportunities in the past year? If so, why? What can we do to more effectively engage with them going forward? And speaking of going forward, we also suggest taking a forward-looking approach, right? Yes, voice of the customer exercises are often sort of a snapshot, uh, a health check, if you will, of the current state of customer relationships. But be opportunistic about this. Think about what types of feedback we can get to help the business 
going forward, particularly when it comes to innovation, right? What are the pain points customers experience? What are their frustrations in the, in the customer experience? Are there unmet needs, underserved needs that they're having that we could potentially use as a new product development opportunity? Okay, going forward, one of the things we want to do, obviously, is we could say socialize, socialize the process and the results. All right, so you talk, here you are. We've been kicking around the idea of doing this voice of the customer, and my salespeople are suddenly absolutely panicked. What do you mean you're going to go talk to my customer? I talk to my customer. I don't want you to talk to my customer. How come you're having somebody else talk to my customer who's not even in the company? Well, involve them. And let them understand that this is as much for their benefit as it is for the company as a whole. This is something where we really want to make sure we're not doing this in a vacuum. We cannot, in any shape or form, whether we're doing an 80-20 exercise or whether we're doing a voice of the customer exercise for a company, we cannot do it in a vacuum. It cannot remain at the C-suite or the general manager level or the portfolio manager level. It has to go deep into the organization. It has to be felt by everyone. If you have poor product quality from a manufacturing standpoint, you're not going to fix it from the executive suite. You're going to have to fix it at the plant floor. So in order to have the plant understand, the, the person in charge of, of running that machine, what do they need to be looking for, what do they need to be watching for, they have to understand that they are as, as much a critical touch point for the customer as anyone. In fact, probably even more so. So trying to involve your entire organization into understanding what we're doing and why we're doing it and where we need to go obviously means that we have to make sure that people are on board. And importantly, have it as, uh, certainly it will improve your KPIs. Most business-to-business -business companies have solid scorecards that, that their customers rate them against. And obviously they're always saying, well, I don't think the scorecard's very fair. It's not really a true reflection. Well, this, this is a way to get a true reflection of what's going on. And certainly as you make improvements and you improve and result in, in profitability as well as revenue increases, yeah, we share the rewards. We let it spread throughout the organization so that everyone understands this is what is gained. Certainly when we look at the results, here we are back to our airline, not except that all customers are not created equally. We don't treat them fairly, poorly, we just treat them differently. If you're a top customer, yes, you get on the plane first. If you are a top customer of a restaurant, yes, we'd love to mix this particular cocktail that you just experienced somewhere else. Um, you know, to everyone else who obviously is the family with six, uh, no, I'm sorry, we can't board you before anyone else on the plane um, boards, but since you have an infant under two, we'll let you board before the second group boards. So the airlines have perfected this whole concept to an absolute art, as have many other companies. And you can recognize their profitability, you can recognize their revenue growth. It's not exactly hurting them to use an 80-20 mindset and to use voice of the customer very diligently and judiciously for yes and or no, but I can do this for you. Yeah, it reminds me of like what they teach you on day one in improv classes. You never say no. If you're in a tricky situation and you don't know how to move the conversation forward, you say yes and improvise, right? But the top customers, it's okay to say no, right? We'll make an exception there. However, remember that the whole point of this is not to treat anyone poorly. It's just to treat people differently based on the value to your organization. And then finally, um, following up with intent, and I think this is a really important one, is the last thing you want to happen is you go through the exercise of getting feedback from your top customers and you put together a really nice report and you send it out and it just ends up on some shelf and, and plus dust, right? That's not the point of this. The point of this is to be a very living document that you can implement quickly to realize rapid gains. How do you do that? you follow up with customers that you interview, right? You go after the project is complete, you visit with them, you say, hey, these are some issues that you raised. Here's some things we have in mind to address that issue. What do you think? Will this work for you? What other suggestions do you have? So 
you treat it like a closed loop set of feedback. You align it with your strategic plan and you really hold yourself accountable. As Kay mentioned, using this as a KPI, using it as a, a, a gauge that someone's responsible for tracking, that's when we really see value extracted from this type of work. If you're doing it just to understand where you are today, it's not nearly as powerful as if you're using it as a continuous improvement tool to understand how you can get better going forward. So when we look at, at right now, everybody's saying, hey, yeah, uh, this, this sounds good, but prove it, prove it out. So here's a case study. We had a B2B manufacturing company that was actually um, finding that they were trying to service everybody the same way. They were strapped. They were absolutely so at a point where they couldn't figure out how they could grow their revenue. The revenue had been fairly stagnant and they decided to take on an 80-20 as well as a voice of the customer to try to understand 80-20 was first. So in essence, it simplified the business as we started to look at it. Um, they went from servicing 45 customers to focusing on on roughly 15 customers. So again, you can imagine the amount of resources, both human as well as intellectual and financial resources that were suddenly freed up in order to focus on 15 customers as opposed to all customers. So in reality, what happened in little less than 18 months, revenue was up 20% and profitability was up 30%. They clearly had begun to socialize what they were doing with their customers, their top customers, letting them know strategically, this is what we're doing. We're going to start focusing on top customers. And when we did the follow on VOC, one of the quotes that we heard was they apply the 80-20 principle and are looking for the right companies to work with. That says they want to be partners or don't do it at all. I really like that. There's a top customer who will be a raving fan who will stay with them who says, hey, I get it, I understand it. I can't 80-20 my business, but man, do, am I getting the benefits of what they're doing? So again, it's a very real world strategic tool that can drive monetary improvements dramatically. So as Anthony said, in many cases, we do this right before, a, towards the tail end of a portfolio company ownership, where you say, hey, you know, we really want to try to make sure we can not only get back our multiples, but gain more, uh, get more profitability out of our hold. So a short-term fix that would drive 20% revenue to your bottom line and 30% profitability, I'd, I would challenge you to say, look at every portfolio company you have that's underperforming and consider, would this work for them? Yes, the answer is it definitely would work for them. And importantly, what you're doing is you would be selling off an asset to the next investor who would have the capability of making that run rate, profitability rate, continue even further. Because once we do this with a company, and once it's ingrained, once we take away all the emotion that occurs with a lot of these issues, um, because people say, oh, no, that's a favorite customer of mine. They've been a customer for 50 years, and I've been with them for the last 10. Yeah, but if we're losing the dramatic amount of money with them, should we really have that customer in our customer base? Could they be better served by someone else, a distributor, for instance, who would have the ability to handhold them when we can't? So again, when you're looking at the portfolio and you're looking at if revenue's been stagnant, if profitability's been weak or, or shrinking, then by all means, consider an 80-20 principle. Consider a voice of the customer to try to understand what's driving it and importantly, start using some of the tools that are readily available and can be exercised with great efficiency and with great result in a really short time period when you consider how long you traditionally would hold on to uh, a company. So with that, um, we're going to go to, are there any questions? Anthony, do we have any questions? There's actually a question um, let's see, that touches on what you ended with. How soon can I expect results from initiative like this? Um, typically, we'll see it sometimes. Sometimes, I mean, if the company is very, very aggressive in what they're um, actually doing, we'll see improvements within the first um, three quarters of a year. So in other words, three quarters. Uh, oftentimes, it, it tends to be 
again, because it's a discipline and because we have to exercise um, trying to help companies exit from our protective arm, in some cases that takes a little bit longer. But critically, I mean, we see results, literally payback for all of these falls to the bottom line. So the investment, the ROI on these is, is quite dramatic. Whatever, whatever you have invested is normally returned within 18 to 24 months. And, and on the on VOC specifically, I mean, there's been situations where we'll hear customers say the format of their invoice is just really difficult. They could just change that. That would make things so much easier for you. Or the, the process for getting a purchase order. Instances like that, you can you can start implementing changes within a week, right? There's oftentimes with top customers, the pain points, the frustrations are pretty manageable. They're just slight changes in the customer experience that for, for the most part can be quickly adopted to realize short-term gains there as well. What else do we have? Uh, we have, have you experienced any trust issues on the feedback given by customers and how, let me see if I can get to the bottom of that question and, um, hold on, let me see if I can get down to it. And how is the feedback to be trusted? So. Um, Feedback from customers, as a general rule, what we're finding is, is feedback from customers will be very open and very explicit. Um, one of the things we do is, is we have to expect that the customer, because we've reached out to them, the customer is going to want to be as open and straightforward as they can be. There are a couple of ways that we make sure they're not trying to stack the deck on us. We'll ask a, uh, one particular uh, objective may be asked in a couple of different ways. We're also making sure that we're talking to more than one customer so that we're getting getting what we call a consistent story as opposed to the one-offs. So that's how you build in this trust factor, uh, importantly, to try to understand what's really going on. And you talked to some examples of company culture change to support 80-20 actions. Uh, on this one, I think you know people start off with saying, to make this work, it is essential to have buy-in from the very top. This has to be a CEO operating partner sanctioned initiative because there are going to have to be some really tough decisions made, particularly when it comes to deciding what to do with those lesser value customers. Uh, in terms of culture, you know, I think it's, it's helping uh, internally everyone understand that decisions that are being made will be difficult, uh, especially with those account managers that have that personal emotional relationship with the customer, oftentimes decades or more, uh, helping them understand that we're, again, we're not going to treat anyone poorly. We're just going to adjust the way we're servicing customers to make sure it's in alignment with the value to the organization. So yeah, I mean, the culture is definitely a part of this, but I think having that buy-in from the very top uh, is critical to get to get consensus and alignment with, with the rest of the organization. Um, I'll add one thing to that, Anthony, which is one of the culture changes that we see is because we ha are basically reallocating re resources in many instances. Um, it it helps it, from a culture standpoint. It brings a, a great deal of enthusiasm because now you're not having to slog through everything all the time. You have focus and you have you have the ability to say, we can use these resources now to go out and do some new product development where we probably couldn't necessarily spend as much time with it before because we were too busy trying to cover all the bases with all the customers. So we see a lot, in many cases, we see a lot of enthusiasm and we see a lot of invigoration of a company from a culture standpoint. This one is always one of my favorites. So customers being cultivated won't make the 80-20 cut. What do we do with them? So. We've got what we call whales, we've got baby whales, and we have minnows. Our top customers are whales. Somewhere in quartile two, three, four, there's what we call baby whales, and there's a whole lot of minnows. Physiologically, a minnow can never become a whale, but a baby whale can grow up to be a whale. So what we say is when you're looking at, at, at a quartiles two, three, and four, identify those baby whales, identify those ones that have potential to grow up to be a top customer. 
look for customers that share characteristics with your top accounts. Are they in fast growth industries? Has their spend been increasing? Things like that can help us understand which of those quartile two, three, four customers may be worth the investments um, to include uh, in customer insight initiatives such as VOC. Um, we had a good question on how do you, do you change your approach for service companies? Um, we've been using the word product. Uh, we tend to use that almost as a generic tool, tool here. Um, this works extraordinarily well for service companies as well. Uh, in essence, the services that the company are providing goes through the same kind of uh, assessments. It works great for tech companies. It works great for companies who are doing a mix of, of um, services as well. So absolutely, it, it, works, it works the same way. Um, again, we just try to isolate what's going on and try to understand where the services are best felt. You can still find which services are driving the be better part of your revenue by tracking those kinds of things. Yeah, some of, these, some of these questions are getting cut off. There's one, something along the lines of how do you change your approach when there's a company and the largest customer is 50% and you have a total of 3,000 customers. I think it's something along the lines of that. Um, we, we don't really change the approach. Yeah. The, the rule tends to hold true What's nice about Voice of the Customer in particular is that it's a very scalable approach. You know, there's oftentimes we go into portfolio companies where there's extreme concentration. We've seen instances where one customer is 90% of the business, right? We scale the approach accordingly, right? So if there's only really five, 10 customers that matter, we only need to talk to the five or 10 that matter. There's still a majority of the business that's still where a majority of the story lies, if you will. And just, just by virtue of talking to them, we'll understand what we can do to get better. In an instance like that, what we may do is also suggest talking to prospects, talking to lost, uh, lost customers to understand what we can do to potentially diversify the customer base. But as strictly a customer exercise, the approach really doesn't change. Yeah, flip side was asked, uh, what do you do if there's minimal concentration? Um, you know, minimal concentration is, is another another problem, but you, again, apply to Anthony's point, if you were to, almost anybody can do it. If you take and run of those, let's say you have 3,000 customers, run those 3,000 customers for revenue, and you will start to see some breakpoints. And nine chances out of 10, even though you have 3,000 customers, you're gonna see the same kind of 25% of those customers are probably 89%. So remember the 89.73 and one percentages of revenue, we see it time and time again, whether it's a company with lots of customers, say K3000, or whether it's a company with a much smaller concentration. So um, our first suggestion for you would be to run the, run the 25 percenters on those 3000 customers and see what your data is showing you. you again, part of the beauty behind both 8020 and VOC is is the data. You want to try to look at what the data is telling you. What 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 are the stories behind the data? The VOC side, yes, we have a lot of qualitative, but we quant it out as well. So, again, challenge for um, you would be to take those 3,000 customers, run the 20, you know, 25, 25, 25, 25, and see where the revenue falls. Yeah, it, it, as, as Kay said, it's super easy to do this yourself. If you want to send us over your customer list with revenue, sanitize it if, if you'd like. We can, we can do that for you really quickly. It's amazing how often those numbers hold true. I'd be happy to demonstrate that for you. A um, couple more. Uh, which comes first, 80-20 or VOC? Um, in a perfect world, we'd be doing 80-20 first, at least to run the quartiles. Um, so that we can understand which customers should we be speaking with. Um, we typically would do that so we understand what's going on. Then we start to drive the VOC to make sure we understand what are some of the issues that customers are, are feeling or thinking about. Um, they are powerful tools when they're linked together. They can distinctly be separated apart as well. Um, the greatest power comes when they are linked, because clearly, but some businesses aren't ready. They don't have raving fans, so we have to try to figure out how to simplify the business before we even think about trying to go out and talk to customers. So a lot of it depends on the maturity of the business, um, where it falls, how it's been managed before, 
uh, those kinds of things. And, and again, we are not saying, oh, you absolutely positively have to do both. These are both powerful tools individually, and when they are linked, they become extremely powerful tools. But um, again, we find that this is a great way to accelerate portfolio value, um, just from the standpoint of, of looking at being more data-driven as opposed to um, one of the things we know with, with operating partners is one of the first things you try to do is find the synergies. And how can we carve out the synergies? Well, now what we're doing is saying, how can we simplify the business? So that, that falls out of that synergies la layer where you try to say, okay, we only need one customer service center. So now that we've put these two companies together, we're going to get rid of half of the customer service team. That's the synergistic approach that's been used um, by private equity investors for a long, long time. But the, these become yet one more maturing steps in how to help a company grow yeah. and profit. Yeah, make more by doing less is kind of the mantra of 80-20. There's a, there's a lot more questions we didn't get to. If we, if we weren't able to address your question, we will follow up with you via email. Uh, thanks everyone for your time. Our contact info is here and, and ACG will be sending these slides out later today, tomorrow. So anything else that you need from us, feel free to reach out and, and thanks again for joining. Yeah, and we will have your questions. Um, so if, if we didn't get to them, Anthony or I will circle back with you via email and answer those questions individually. But thank you so much for um, joining us this afternoon.